So our reading uh, this evening is from Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32, um, on page 1096 of the Church Bibles, if you want to follow it there. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Let's pray together. In Christ we are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Lord, thank you for these words. We pray now this evening that you will open our eyes to see the realities of being part of that one body in Christ, indwelt by the spirit, called to glorify your name. We ask this in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. It's a funny old reading. I'll just make that comment, and then I'll start. What comes to mind when you hear the word fellowship? In 1977, uh, it meant singing a chorus called Bind Us Together with a warm, fuzzy feeling, holding hands And if you could slightly close your eyes, but not completely, and sway a little, that's the way you express fellowship. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together. (laughs) You've never heard that chorus, have you? Oh, yes, you have, yeah. Perhaps for you, fellowship means more the peace and lots of hugs. Perhaps it means coffee with a Christian friend. Perhaps it comes back as a Bible study with people that you've known for two, three, four years. At its best, someone came to Nick's now, I would think, probably 20, 25 years ago, uh, actually to see what her husband was up to because he'd started to come to the church and she didn't go. And she says, you know what actually brought me to Christ? And she's still in the church. 
She said, everyone seemed to know each other and to love one another. It was infectious. So what does fellowship mean to you? This is a a disturbing story, and it made me, as I was working with it, rethink and broaden what I understand by the word fellowship. It questions many of my most cherished assumptions about fellowship, and it pushes me all the time to redefine what I understand by the term. Maybe it's not just the peace and lots of hugs. Four points. Here's the first one. Fellowship involves practical action. Fellowship has a, a hard practical edge to it. Fellowship in this passage means money. It means houses. It means property. It might be better translated as it sometimes is in the New Testament as partnership. In the body of Christ, fellowship meant a radical change of perspective. No greed, because no one claimed his possessions were his own, says the passage. No need, there was no needy person, because the money went to anyone who had need. Giving up the right to dispose of my money the way I wanted to use it, because you notice the apostles did the distributing. And they didn't give just to my friends or the people that I liked, They didn't give even just to the people that they liked or people of the same race or people of the same interests. It had a radically practical, active edge to it. And we might find this quite difficult because I think there's a general assumption that my possessions are mine and our fellowship is primarily expressed in common worship and prayer together and in small groups, and in church of activities. Maybe some generosity by the way of visiting, or babysitting, or making casseroles for people who just had babies. But here it meant costly giving and serious sharing. The great thing is it can still happen today. I know someone called Simon, who loaned his Volvo estate to a friend whose daughter had just crashed the family car That very day, the day before they went on holiday, he said, I'll take my Volvo. I know someone who came to a parish weekend that I was at who said, I can come to this weekend away, but only because someone has paid for me anonymously and secretly. And these are encouraging examples of what it means to be in the fellowship, the body of Christ. They take us back to this passage And just remind us that fellowship has a hard, practical edge to it. It had to do with the house and property that you owned and selling it, letting somebody else use the money and not thinking that it's yours. That's the first thing in the passage that I find. The second thing is that fellowship is a shared experience. The believers were one, it says, in heart and in mind, better even in heart and one soul, because they all shared a common experience. And the sin of Ananias and Sapphira is not primarily about the money, is it? They didn't have to sell the property. Nobody made them. They didn't have to say how much they got for it. Nobody asked them. They didn't have to give all that they got for it to the church. They gave, and the church wasn't defrauded in any way at all. They got, presumably, a very generous donation. But Ananias and Sapphira still sinned. So exactly where was the sin? The really important thing about fellowship was that they were of one heart and one soul. And sadly, Ananias and Sapphira said they were giving everything, but were really keeping some of the profits back, but still boasting that they were giving everything. And you see them, where is the betrayal of the fellowship? The betrayal is not in the money. 
The betrayal is in the heart. It's unseen, unknown to everyone else, except, as it turns out, Peter. But it matters terribly. It matters terrifyingly. It matters because it breaks the fellowship at the level of the heart. This sin doesn't appear on the balance sheet. As I say, the church got a generous gift. It doesn't even appear as an injury to the church because they didn't tell anybody till it all came out. But they know in their hearts that they have betrayed something precious. At Philippi, two women were in a fierce quarrel with each other. It comes out in the letter to the Philippians. And Paul pleads with them to agree with each other. And look at the way he does it. He refers to these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. And what he's talking about, contended, what he's talking about then is remember our shared experience of the power of God, of the presence of the Spirit, of the love that we had for Jesus and for one another. Remember the shared experience. You can imagine him saying to them, do you remember when we were scared stiff? When we all slept badly because we knew what we had planned to do the following day in Philippi? Do you remember when it looked as if they were going to throw stones at us? Do you remember the joy when the first people came to Christ? And what Paul is referring to with these two children, or these two women who are loggerheads together, is remember the good shared experience that we had in the past. Don't let a disagreement now blot out the fantastic experience that the three of us had then. It's about a shared experience, fellowship. The Book of Common Prayer has a line in it that I think, or rather sadly, just got dropped. They just chucked it overboard when they wrote the new services and even the common worship service. But if you go back to the Book of Common Prayer, as you come to the table, as everyone's welcoming you here in this church where we would be talking about gluten-free and things like that, and we would be welcoming people to the table, the Book of Common Prayer says at that point, the minister says, ye that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors, draw near with faith. Interesting how that line just got chucked. And yet it's vitally important. Because no one will ever know except God if you are not in love and charity with your neighbors. It's coming at the level of the heart and the mind. That's where the fellowship is. The unkind thought, it's saying, counts before you come to communion. The bitter resentment which you never admit and don't show in the face even because you've practiced, that also counts. The instantaneous decision that you might have made not to speak to someone because you're ever so slightly miffed by them or you've decided to punish them a little and make them work for your goodwill. The, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, says the Bible, and it probably is. No one will ever know, you think, and it doesn't matter much anyway. It matters to God very much. And it damages the fellowship, not in public, nobody knows, but it damages it in the unseen world where all hearts are open, all desires known, and no secrets are hidden. Fellowship involves what's going on in the heart, and it consists of not damaging the shared experience we have of the Holy Spirit. Third point. As we read the passage, we realize that fellowship is a spiritual battleground. And the battle is between the Holy Spirit and Satan. The story moves along on ground level on earth, taking place in Jerusalem. 
But Peter shows that in reality, a cosmic struggle is being played up up there in the heavenlies. We read the story and it's here on earth in a place called Jerusalem. It's Peter who draws the curtain on one side. There is a cosmic battle going on up there and you are a part of it. Can you see what was really happening? The spirit had created, because of the death of Christ and his resurrection, had created something beautiful, a new creation. There they were, men and women, 120 of them, 3,000 of them, as we went on. It was Eden all over again. It was a community that God had made by his spirit, which showed love and not hate, unity and not division, that gave rather than grabbed, which built up rather than tore down. And such a community was unknown on earth. It was something wonderful, and it had the fragrance and the beauty of the world to come. It was briefly heaven on earth, a sign of the kingdom. It was so fragile, so precious, so attractive. As Paul says elsewhere, if anyone is in Christ, bang, new creation. Free translation. That's right. And God had made this. And now they bust it up. They broke it. Imagine I go to a, a home, and I'm pretty frequently actually. You can tell it's a re- relative, isn't it? And they have wine glasses, the most beautiful things you've ever seen. and so precious, long, thin, so, oh, they're lovely. And I help with the drying up. It's a nightmare. I, I fear I will have a heart attack one day because it comes to me and it's beautiful. And you're just thinking, all I've got to do is, is that and it'll snap or drop it and that's it. It was a wedding present. Oh, my goodness. So when it's over, I have to sit down in a darkened room for some time. Uh, But can you imagine, this thing that God has made is being passed around among us. And it comes to Ananias and Sapphira and say, no one will ever know if we chuck it. Oh, it's broken. Well, 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 well. It's a pity, isn't it? Do you realize what's going on there? That something happened which was the equivalent of the Garden of Eden all over again. What will Satan try to do to the fellowship? He'll try to do what he did in Eden. He'll use all in his power to break that unity, to smash that precious vessel, and he will laugh when it all goes wrong. Peter says, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. You tempt God, you push him to the limits, you dare him to touch you. You're saying to him, it doesn't matter if I drop this. Let's see if God will catch it. I dare him to let it break. And Peter, with sadness and in consternation, I think, says, how can you have let Satan fill your heart? Now, what's going on here isn't a little bit of, you know, secret embezzlement. It wasn't even that. A little bit of deceit, doesn't matter. Everybody does it. It was something really vital. Are we aware of that dimension in our fellowship People fall out over nothing. I was missed off the rotor. I was not thanked properly. I don't like the hymns. I actually know of a schism in a church because the color of the flowers didn't fit the liturgical color of the season. Sometimes a man's got to do what a man's got to do and you're making protests of all that and crumbs what's happening to the fellowship and these petty little disagreements play out on earth what is a battle in the unseen realm and the serious schisms of which there are some in the church and the divisions are victories of satan and if you listen carefully you can hear satan sniggering fellowship is a battle between the Holy Spirit and Satan. And let's make sure with prayer and supporting one another, we're not on the wrong side. And the last, uh, I 
I think, the last aspect it shows of our fellowship is fellowship is a focus of holy power. Our fellowship is shot through with the holiness of God. At first, they didn't see this. The whole passage begins with lots of power and lots of grace. It's wonderful. The passage ends with, and fear was upon all. Did you see that? Ananias and Sapphira felt it first. But note how Luke avoids saying that Peter cursed them. Peter doesn't curse them in the passage. In fact, Peter gives Sapphira a chance to confess her deceit. Nor does Luke say that God smote them. All Luke says is he fell down. Heart attack, stroke, whatever. Luke allows us to say that Ananias suddenly saw that what he thought was a little secret between him and his wife that was safely hidden and didn't matter very much was open to God. And in the power of the Spirit, the numinous power of the Spirit, was open to Peter as well. And the shock of that revelation killed him. So with his wife. And fear touched the church, and then it touched all those outside who heard about this incident. Why? Because the shiver up the spine told them that fellowship is something that God cares about. And God is not mocked, and he may not be treated casually. The Christians suddenly saw what it was to have God dwelling among them and that he was a living, refining fire. And Peter himself was touched with that holiness and could see into the heart. And great fear, godly fear, reverent fear seized the whole church. I bet it did. This may explain the strange verse, verse 13, which we didn't read. No one else dared associate with them. Isn't that interesting? We've just had growth, 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 and suddenly, just verse 13. Now, why was that? Because suddenly people started to realize that to join a Christian fellowship means reckoning with the power that you are taking on. You are not just dealing with joining a bridge club or a group that you drink with on Thursdays. You are joining a body which has been created by the living God. And God cares about our unity and our life together. We may not treat him casually as a bit of a mate. He's soft and easily fooled. We run into the Holy of Holies we have a quick and easy confession. We're not too bothered to make the effort to listen to his voice, so we pick and choose whether we will obey him or not. Half-hearted discipleship, self-indulgent prayers. Well, God is not like that. Perhaps if we were all more conscious of the fact that God inhabits this community, lives within it, we maybe would see more of what we pray for quite a lot, that people outside the church would sense the weight of his presence when they came into our services and into our meetings. Fellowship is a focus of holy power. Well, I found it a disturbing story. It is, isn't it? It's, not, it's disturbing not so much for the strange deaths, I think, but for the way in which it just unpicks so many things that I call fellowship. The story questions so many of my, my cherished assumptions about fellowship. And it leaves me with the question, what am I to do now? And there's a great line in St. Paul. Okay, pursue all that makes for peace and builds up the common life. Amen. I have had uh, many occasion to be thankful for David's ministry.
in this church and when I saw that the reading was Ananias and Sapphira uh, this evening, I was again uh, grateful for his ministry. Thank you uh, for your message this evening. One of the joys of fellowship uh, that David referred to, one of the privileges, one of the opportunities is building one another up. Uh, building one another up in prayer. Being able as a family to pray for one another, not least as we respond to that call of God upon our lives. So as we stand uh, this night on the eve of our mission week, responding to that call of God to go out and to make disciples of all, we're going to pray for one another, pray particularly for the mission team. So I'm going to invite Andrew uh, to come on up and to uh, explain a little about what's going to be going on over the next seven days. And then David's going to come up and lead us in some prayer. Andrew. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew. My wife and I, we, we go to St. Nick's. We usually attend the 11 service. Uh, we have a little one-year-old son. Um, my wife's the church operations manager here, and I'm a student at the university doing a PhD. Um, five years ago, before I moved to the UK, someone told me, if you're doing ministry in a city in the UK, then you need to just expect that people are going to come to you. So don't bother to try to go out and tell people about who Jesus is, because it's not worth your time. Just don't do it. won't work. So I remember the night that I moved to the UK, I thought, oh, I'm just going to try this anyway. I was in Manchester, and I thought, I'm going to go out with the Christian Union, and we're going to go out, and let's just see if we can engage with some students and talk about faith. And I remember we, wet, we met this girl. Her name was Elizabeth, and um, she was on her way to, to some of the nightclubs in the city center. And on her way to the nightclubs, we stopped her, and we had about a four-hour conversation. We got to talk about faith. We got to tell her who Jesus is. And she decided by the end of that conversation, I want to follow Jesus. I want to know what a relationship with Christ is like. And that started this journey for me over the last five years of realizing, actually, what we really need in the church is boldness to share our faith, to tell people about who Jesus is. And if anything captures what we're going to be doing in this week of mission, that's it. That if we don't go, who will? Because Jesus has said we need to go. He said, go and make disciples. Tell other people about who I am and what I've done. That they would follow me and that they would obey me as well. Um, and so we need your help to do that this week. There's two ways that we need your help. The first is, would you come and serve along with us? Would you come in and share about your faith? There'll be many of opportunities to do that, both during the day, if you've got a free hour or two, to come out and just chat with people and engage people in conversations about faith. We'd love for you to help in that way. The other thing is, would you come along to some of our evening events? So every single evening this week, we're going to have, and we're calling it Discovery Week, we're going to have different events. Uh, some of them are fellowship-based, where we want to draw people into community. Some of them are faith-based talks. But every single week at 7 o'clock, we're going to have some kind of event. And we're kicking that off tomorrow with a pub quiz, because who likes a good pub quiz? So would you come and take part uh, in our pub quiz? Would you come along for some of the other events that we've got this week? And we've got more information, which you can find on the welcome desk about that. The second way that we would like for you to, to help with us um, and stand with us this week is, at the very end, to cap off this week of mission, we're going to have an invitation service uh, and this service next week will be an invitation service. So would you please invite a friend along to join us for that service? We think that it's a great way to cap off the week, and it'll be, we expect, and we're just expecting that there'll be lots of first-time guests who are joining us for the first time that week. Um, but there are also ways to pray for us if you can't be involved. Uh, we would like to spend a few moments now in prayer, but also ask you and invite you to pray during the week. And I'd just like to invite David up to share a few ways that we can pray this week. Thanks, Andrew. Um, again, if you don't know me, my name's David. I'm a third-year undergrad here in uh, Durham. Um, and can we have those slides up? Thanks. 
Um, as, you, as you just got a glimpse of there, we've got a big vision for this week ahead. Um, it's a really important vision to see Jesus move in our world and to bring the gospel um, to everyone we meet. Um, and we've got a, a big God. So we really expect and want to see God move. Uh, but before all of that, we want to give this. Uh, we want to give some time in prayer, because um, we. Uh, well, one of the ways I think of prayer is this is an opportunity to open up uh, situations, ourselves, our church, and our world to God. It's just inviting Him in. Uh, so one of the ways we've done this to start with is over the last 24 hours, uh, we've had a time of prayer. So people have been praying in the community center down the road, uh, and they've been praying in the homes if they can't get to the community center. And it's been really, really fantastic to see us all getting involved uh, in opening up these situations to God, uh, this week to God. Um, And it's been great to have encouragements by people writing down the prayers that they feel that God's led them in and some prophecies from God uh, and also some scriptures just as a way that God is leading us and encouraging us and equipping us. And there are some scriptures there up on the screen. Uh, But I just want to draw attention to two of the scriptures that we were uh, given. Uh, Don't worry, you don't have to furiously find these. I'll read them out. Um, The first is 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 19. Uh, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And the second uh, verse is Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, where we read, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This is a big uh, vision. This is the big God reconciling not just small parts, um, but the whole world to himself. Um, And that can be scary, but we're drawn into that ministry. That's what this week is all about. But God, uh, and and we're aware that Nix as a, a community hasn't done this in a long time, this sort of thing, but we believe God is calling us to be bold, to be courageous, because he loves us and he's there with us and he equips us. And that's why we want to spend some time now in prayer. Um, There should be some sheets uh, with about the ratio of uh, one between every two people in front of you. Um, That's just uh, something you can take away. Uh, We'd love it if as a community, um, as a fellowship, we could pray for this week. So it's just split up into a few prayer suggestions each day about the ways that we can uh, really pray and ask God to get involved in our week. Um, But the second way that we just want to do that is to actually spend some time now in prayer. Uh, And the way we want to do that is just breaking off into groups around us. Uh, So, for example, seven people or something like that. Um, And just to use some of the suggestions on the sheets. There are also some suggestions up on the screen of the sorts of things we can pray for, for just a few minutes as as a group. Um, Feel free to uh, read, just read off those suggestions or to go off script, whatever you're comfortable with. Feel free to pray out loud if you're comfortable or in the quiet of your hearts if if that's where you're at. Um, That's fantastic. God God hears both the prayers out loud and in our hearts. Um, And don't be afraid of silence or or short prayers. We don't need to um, fluff it up with long words. Um, But we just want to spend, therefore, some time now in in breaking off into these groups, say about five minutes, uh, just giving this, this week to God, inviting him in, uh, and expecting him to move in power. So again, if you know, pray out loud if that's where you're comfortable. Pray in the quiet of your hearts if that's where you're comfortable. If you're uh, new to Nix or you're not really a Christian, don't worry about that. Uh, maybe just start by introducing yourselves to those around you uh, if you don't know them. So should we just break off into those groups now just with the people around us and let's just start praying for these things. <laughs> 